Hello, everyone. Good day. Welcome to News 24 Frontline. My name is Konita Hunter, and today we are unpacking the third part of the state capture inquiry report that was made public this week. It was the most voluminous report, four, four volumes to be exact, on one topic, almost a thousand pages dedicated to Busasa and the corruption that took place at that company for more than a decade. So what was Pusasa and what did it do to warrant the detailed probe by the state capture inquiry? Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo wrote, and I quote, Pusasa was a business organization that was heavily invested in securing tenders from government departments and organs of state against the backdrop of all the evidence received by the commission in connection with Pusasa and the extent to which its business model was based on its ab uh, ability to influence public office bearers, one need merely consider the potentially catastrophic consequences for Busasa if the ANC were to be voted out of power. To understand how important the provision of the war room facilities to the ANC was in order for Busasa to be able to achieve its business objectives. I'm joined today by a fantastic panel of experts, I would say, Adrian Besson is the editor-in-chief of News24. Kyle Cohen is News24's investigative journalist. Karen Morn is News24's specialist reporter. And Karam Singh is a legal researcher at Corruption Watch. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Thank you. So we have a lot to unpack in, the, in this hour. Uh, Adrian, let's start with you. Uh, it's. It, I mean, I was shocked when I read in the report that Bosasa had been um, operating under this cloud that it had been for 17 years. You've been on Bosasa's tail for many of those years. How did you feel when you were just reading the report, uh, 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 Adrian? And, and, and how long have you been on Bosasa's tail? <laughs> Yeah, Kunita, I've I've been uh, I've been on the Busasa case longer than I've been married or had kids for, so uh, it's been quite a long extent of my adult life. Um, at least sixteen years since Karine Duplessis um, and myself, she was my former colleague at Build and De Burger, um, picked up on this company that was getting all the tenders in correctional services. Um, I definitely felt uh, a sense of uh, vindication and justice this week uh, as the report dropped. Um, I specifically printed out the entire uh, volumes uh, to to read through. I haven't finished, um, but it's actually it's it's I'm going through quite a bit of emotions when I read it because some of the things in there we already printed in 2006, 2007 before Jacob Zuma was even president of South Africa. Um, and uh, these things have been known. It's, it was known for at least 15 years that they were writing tenders for the President's Department, that they were close to Linda Mati, the former head of correctional services, that they were buying houses and cars for the CFO of the department. Um, so um, I also get angry when I read these things and realize that we've been waiting for uh, almost two decades before any action has been taken. And some of the people involved in the corruption still today of free has never seen the inside of a courtroom and Gavin Watson unfortunately the I think one of the architects of the Busasa scheme is no longer with us um, and uh, you know one would have wanted to see him facing justice as well so I think a mix of vindication happiness but also anger and and regret over the time we have lost and about the damage that's been done to the fabric of our country through not having prosecutions um, in this case and many others of course. When you read this report, uh, Adrian, you almost get a sense that Busasa were the original architects of state capture because they 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 literally, you know, had this modus operandi of using their influence in the ANC and their proximity to ANC leaders, their proximity to to officials in the state, and obviously uh, the, the pre later on the president, and then and then going you know further to protect themselves. From being prosecuted when when um, they uh, you know the SIU was investigating Busasa, am, am I right, Adrian, in that assessment that that perhaps Busasa and Gavin Watson were the original architects of what we have later learned uh, to be state capture, and probably that's why it was important for the Zonda Commission to to 
to probe it in the way that it did. Kunita, I don't think I don't think you're wrong. I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that. I think um, at the time, 2006-7, when we were started to probe this, I think Karam was still with the special investigating unit at the time. The, we, there wasn't a term like state capture. I mean, we didn't speak about state capture. We knew there was corruption and fraud and money laundering was even still a new concept. Um, what I now realize looking back is that Busasa is the perfect case to illustrate state capture. And if I can just briefly sum it up in the way I understand it is, you know, a normal corruption case in the, in the, in the classic sense is a, a government official often handing out a tender for some kind of work in government to a businessman, businessman bribing the government official uh, to award them the tender. What Bosasa did was much more insidious. They ingrained and ingratiated themselves not only into the departments and the policy, but also into the ANC and the ANC strategy. So Bosasa was pivotal in making sure that the Department of Correctional Services, for example, started outsourcing core functions of the department, like catering to prisoners. That is something that the Department of Correctional Services officials with inmates as part of their rehabilitation were doing for many years before 2004, 2005, when they won their first big tender for catering. So Busasa was instrumental to getting, ironically, this ANC government to outsource, to privatize state functions because they had a long plan. They had a plan of paying off these officials, paying off the politicians and enriching themselves. And for me, that is at the heart of state capture is when you are so corrupt, when you are so deep entrenched into government spending that you can dictate government policy, government spending, the way that government prioritizes service delivery. And we saw that later with the Guptas as well, when they literally influenced things like SAA strategic decisions on which routes to cancel and which to take. And I think um, looking back now, that really is, 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 was, was a definition of state capture. Busasa was born inside the heart of the ANC. It was born in the house of Nosiviwe Mapisa Ngakula, the Speaker of Parliament, and her husband, Charles Ngakula, the former Minister of Safety and Security. And um, when a, a group of ANC Women's League leaders were approached by one of the Watson brothers, Ronnie Watson, to say, let's start a company to help you make money. You've just come back from from the struggle, you don't have enough money, let's try to set up something. And that moved into Busasa, which was then, I would argue, hijacked by the Watsons, and specifically Gavin Watson, who became the mastermind behind um, pilfering millions and billions of rands from government and just kept on handing out these, uh, mm -hmm. you know, bribe packs, parcels of cash and whatever to politicians and civil servants. Yeah, Kyle, let me bring you in here. You, I mean, you've re reported on um, on a lot of um, uh, the the thousand pages that that came out this week. Can you just sum up very quickly the main recommendation? Who ne who needs to be prosecuted and why? Mm, As per the report. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, Kunita. You know, there are several recommendations, um, and, and I'll start with, you know, um, Mr. Angelo Agritzi, who who was the the star witness in terms of Bosasa. There, there are several recommendations for criminal investigations and charges against him. You know, mostly based on his own testimony. You know, um, the rules of the commission say that you can't be prosecuted for the for the testimony that you give. But it's very clear that Zondo feels that Mr. Agritzi's role in a lot of this is, has been criminal and he should be prosecuted. I'm entirely sure that if Mr. Gavin Watson was still alive, the recommendations would include him. But then we move very quickly away from, you know, the sort of guys who worked at Busasa and who were, you know, driving bags of money around and, you know, cooking up all these schemes together with Gavin. And there's a lot of those kind of people. But then we move to the, the big hitters. So first of all, former President Jacob Zuma, um, Zondo finds that, you know, he, he potentially breached his obligation to the Constitution, uh, pr potentially breached the Executive Ethics Code, and um, he should be criminally investigated for, uh, under PRECA for receiving gratifications from Basasa. Uh, similarly, Dudu Mjeni, uh, similarly, Mr. Gwede Mantashe, the current Minister of Energy, uh, former Water Affairs Minister Nomvula Mokunyane, uh, current, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Deputy Minister for Defence and Military Veterans, Mr. Tabang Makwetla, uh, Mr. Cedric Froelich, Mr. Vincent Smith, um, you know, both uh, heavy heavyweight ANC MPs, one of them is still in Parliament. Um, so it's really a, a, a sort of who's who of the Basasa sort of, you know, the, the Basasa realm um, of ANC politicians, and they've all been 
you know, Zondo said they all need to be investigated for criminal conduct. It's it's quite something. Yeah, and I mean the 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 evidence points to 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 this sort of mixed bag. So it was there, there was not one specific type of 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 person that Basasa would bribe. So it was somebody sitting in a committee in parliament that they would need on their side. And also the gratification, Kyle, was in different means. So it was, you know, security and money to children. And and talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, what, what we've learned about, about that modus operandi um, that Basasa employed during that time. So, Kodita, it's very simple. And, and this is, you know, to, to, to lay it all very bare, and this is what Adrian has done very well, Basasa made sure that it had the right friends on its side. So, for example, uh, Minister Mantashe, he was given security at three of his properties, two of which are in the Eastern Cape, one in Boxburg. And the security was there not as a gratification in exchange for, you know, you we're going to give you this and you're going to give us that. It's about influence buying, right? It's about having friends in the right places kind of thing. And, and this is what happened. So Nomvula Makunyane, her daughter was given hire cars. She was given bribe packs and uh, allegedly Louis Vuitton handbags stuffed full of cash. You know, it's all very Hollywood. But then it comes down to, to basic things like fixing a security gate, uh, coming around when the CCTV cameras don't work and fixing that, um, paying university fees for kids so that they can go to university overseas in the case of one of these former MPs. It's it's really, you know, and th this is what I've, I've written a piece for, for News24 tomorrow. And, and what I point out, Cornita, is that these politicians were kept by Bosasa. You know, their lifestyles were maintained by them. It wasn't only just cash, you know, sort of just to tide you over, pay a, pay a bill here or there. It was hiring a car for your kids so they could get to university and back. It was uh, paying money into your your business account so that you could settle debts. It was all these sort of things. They were they were really all friends together. In the case of mm -hmm. Mr. T and Mr. Patrick Gillingham, the two former correctional services heavyweights, they were built houses and uh, it, expensive furnishings and fittings were imported from overseas to be put inside these homes. And you know, a polo was bought for for Mr. Gillingham's son and these sort of things. You know, so it's it's really just about doing as much as you possibly can over and above just the the normal sort of you know because everyone thinks of bribery as a as an envelope being slid under your door or in a newspaper or you know and it's this is yeah. about maintaining a lifestyle for them over and above what they could afford with their salaries and obviously this played out for so many years karen uh, you know there was that a, a testimony by um, ANC chairperson, he was uh, uh, testifying in his role as ANC Secretary General at the time, Gwede Mantashe, where he, he painted this picture that he was just uh, the Secretary General of an NGO called the ANC, and that he actually didn't wield any power because contracts were were delivered or, or, or contracts were, were were discussed and handed out in government which he was very far away sitting in his sixth floor uh, office in the Tuli house i mean definitely the zondo commission didn't buy that right um and and, and they said it, does, it just doesn't work that way well I, you know just yeah, coming back to Carl's point, for me, the trial of Shabir Sheikh provides a very profound blueprint for the kind of um, sort of almost retainer corruption that we saw Basasa practicing with a number of high level officials. So essentially, they were never, oh, I'll give you X for Y. It was, oh, no, nah, I, I like Shabir Sheikh, who paid everything from Jacob Zuma's children's school fees to rent to Christ, uh, Christmas groceries over a decade long period. If you need help, I will help you. But the, the, pro, the sort of converse of that is when I need help, I can rely on your assistance. It's not dressed up in the ugly languages of bribes and corruption. And I honestly think that some of the individuals involved in this um, have managed to rationalize it quite powerfully as a consequence, precisely because of this embedding in you know, the kind of um, rhetoric that I've heard throughout the Zuma trial that you know, comrades help each other. This is what we do. But where the rubber hits the road, of course, is where you see people um, like parliamentarians, like Vincent Smith, who has an oversight role, for example, to play, suddenly going very soft on a company that's implicated in multi-billion rand corruption and fraud. Um, Gwede Mantash, of course, coming out and saying that 
you know, trying to suggest that this was a consequence of his relationship with a, a high-ranking um, or SASA official, that this was some kind of favor that was done, is very much embedded within that language of friendship. We help each other. We're doing things for each other. But it's, it, it can never be an excuse. And we, we have seen throughout the, throughout the Zondo um, inquiry reports that have emerged that the ANC in many respects is, is, is a criminal enterprise, um, you know, that it itself needs to be put on trial despite its very profound, um, you know, arguments to the contrary. Because what it did was it enabled people to, um, through influencing high-ranking officials within the party, who may not have had a direct role, you know, in bid adjudication committees, through its culture of cater deployment, through its de uh, culture of, you know, I'm here deployed for the ANC, I'm here to do the ANC's bidding. If you bought the favor of a person who was very high-ranking within those structures, you essentially bought the party's support for yourself. And, you know, in with all these different individuals, it wasn't about them necessarily as, you know, person in position X, Y, Z, that that was a player, particularly for the, that was a, that was a factor, particularly for the MPs. It was about this thing of, you know, we support the party and therefore the party's deployees will support us. And I think yeah. that's why Bosasa is such a profoundly important report in the series that has been released. Karam Singh, let me bring you in here. We've been hearing about um, Busasa, like Adrian said, for well over a decade. And I want to talk about um, uh, systems of accountability. The SIU um, did that very famous report um, uh, into uh, Busasa, and it's been uh, a decade and a half or more later. And, and there's still people that um, are yet to face the music. Um, and this report comes... Um, you know, when, when Basasa is now almost dysfunctional and, and a lot of these people have, you know, been implicated also in other crimes, you know, if you want to talk about the Guptas and, and, and uh, et cetera. And so, so I'm wondering, you know, do, do, do we have proper systems uh, in South Africa that, that and, and why is it that, you know, something can be exposed in 2006, 2007, and yet in 2022, um, you, there's still a call for investigations into these these uh, 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 people uh, implicated um, in, in this corruption. Well, I mean, I think the first thing I want to say is that the, there's this this language in the report around the need for further investigations. I think has muddied the waters for the public a little bit and is a little bit confusing, because I think it's clear that in this case the investigations have been done. The investigations are complete. What's left now is for the MPA in the exercise of their mandate that only they can exercise to evaluate the evidence before them to see whether there is sufficient evidence to pursue criminal prosecutions. So that's the remaining investigation that's left. It's almost that, you know, that quintessential last mile. And I think the, the, the commission is very clear and careful about the extent of their mandate and then where the mandate of the police and, and the MPA start. So I think that's that's the one issue. <clears throat> the other issue that's worth reflecting upon historically is, you know, the important role that the SIU plays and the way in which the, the SIU has almost been abused over this period of state capture, because we know that there were lots of proclamations signed under the administration of Jacob Zuma. I mean, when Jacob Zuma ever wanted to speak about his anti-corruption uh, credentials, he would point to the SIU proclamations that he signed. A lot of those reports flowing from those investigations never saw the light of day. You know, I, I think it's fair to say that in some cases, some of those reports were suppressed. So I was at the SIU between 2006 and 2012, when the, the Department of Correctional Services investigation was taking place. And, you know, within SIU circles, within those who, that were reading uh, uh, Adrian stories uh, and others, you know, Bosasa was like a big deal, but yet, um, you know, it didn't gain any traction. And I, you know, I remember after leaving the SIU 20, 2012, you know, what's happening to Bosasa? You know, where's the Bosasa matter? And, you know, and eventually, you know, we, we got the, the cases of um, T and Gillingham in, enrolled. But I think it was a surprise to some of us that when the, the, the commission started, 
that it started so squarely on the Basasa matter because Basasa didn't really feature in the state of capture report from Tuli Madansela. And while we thought we were going to get a commission that was focused uh, purely on the Guptas, we actually got something uh, in addition to that. So, I mean, I think it's 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 so critical and it's important to be able to to draw the linkages now back to a, to an era that some of us would consider was before state capture to see you know these the, the antecedents to 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 what was in place even in the under the administration of Tabo and Becky uh, in terms of a private company like Bosasa having its tentacles in in the governing party and, and into the government. I mean, just a quote from the report, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, that was penned by, by Acting Chief Justice Raymond Zondo saying that corruption was central to Busasa's business model and everything for the company came down to corruption. So regardless of uh, the, you know, tens of millions of rands that they made, they would have not made a single cent um, of that money legitimately, Adrian. There was there was no Busasa without without tender corruption, right? No, and it's it's actually extraordinary the scheme that Watson managed to pull off here, because what, Watson, if you speak to the people who worked around him, Agritzi and others at the beginning, he wasn't really a very skilled guy. You know, he didn't come there with lots of skills. The, the one thing he did was he had struggle connections, mm -hmm. ANC connections. And he bribed. He literally bribed his way into business through bribing union leaders at mining hostels on the west rand of Johannesburg to get those tenders, to get Bosasa into the kitchens, into the catering. Um, and that's when he brought in Agritzi, who was a chef um, who understood the catering world. And onto that catering business, they built, okay, well, if we're catering for you, you can just as well do your security systems. We can do your CCTV. We can do your turnstiles. We can do screens in prisons. Um, unbelievable. I remember, I, I've just remembered actually during this discussion that at some point during our investigation, someone told me, or there was, there was a rumor that at Bosasa there were these cabinets of files of, of, of names of government officials and politicians who were being paid by Bosasa. And it almost sounded gr gr gratuitous. Like I didn't believe at the point that it was that big. I, I, I thought it was some guys who were getting cars and houses and prize and whatever. But I mean, now we know it was that big. We now we know it was it was uh, almost professional corruption, if you want to call it that. It was institutionalized corruption. Um, I mean, it was managed through black books and walk-in safes with with piles of cash. I mean, Carl will remember writing about how they got that cash. You know, through the chicken the chicken guy who they ordered chicken, and then the invoices would be would be far out done through what they really ordered, and they would get the cash. Um, and just this massive scheme being set up. So, so in a way, you know, Watson was brilliant in setting up the scheme through which he had to keep on bribing people. But that was also his downfall, uh, Quinita, is that he had mm. to keep paying people. Um, and that became so much. I mean, like if you're a correctional service employee and you earn 20,000 Rand a month or 15,000 Rand and you get an extra 5,000 Rand a month from Busasa, which is a real example that, that came out at, at the Zonda Commission, you know, you are pretty much captured for life and you, you're you going to need that 5,000 rand. You're going to upgrade your lifestyle. You maybe buy a new car or move houses into a better neighborhood because of the Bosasa money, which uh, which means that you are then, he's then built up this almost army of corrupt officials and politicians that he had to keep on paying, uh, which become an administrative nightmare. And then people start to talk, you know, who got more money, who got less. Agritzi, Agritzi certainly had a huge fallout with Watson, which, which I think was in large uh, part of the motivation for him going to the Zonda Commission. Obviously, also, I think, to come clean, he had a, a life and death, near-death experience, which I think wanted made a great to see one to go and, and come clean uh, for the sake of his, his children and grandchildren. But I think there was also a part of wanting to be the first one to blow the whistle before this whole thing blew up. Um, so it couldn't be sustained. It, 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 it wasn't a scheme that could go on forever. But gosh, they managed to keep it going for a long, long time. And they managed to fund the ANC as a party and ANC officials and politicians for a very, very long time. And thank goodness for Agritzi. I mean, uh, you know, we can debate that. But, but I think Agritzi, with all these mistakes and uh, with, with, with all the contradictions in his evidence, which Zondo doesn't shy away from, he does say in his evidence, in, in his report, 
that yeah. agreed to did sometimes contradict himself. But the core, the main pillars of his evidence was true. And it was backed up by corroborating evidence, like video evidence. You remember that one video that he took from his pocket, from the cell phone in his pocket, where it showed Watson, Watson and Papa Leshabani packing the cash um, for, for government officials. Um, other, other corroborating evidence from other witnesses, paper trials. Um, and if it wasn't for Agritzi, you know, whatever you think of him, we wouldn't have known all these things. Yeah, but I mean, uh, again, to say, uh, um, Adrian, that, that that does not um, take away from his own criminal action, and I think that's that's probably um, what a lot of people will be debating for a long time now. Uh, you know, uh, you you did a noble thing by blowing the whistle, but probably you had you had no other choice because the house would have, anyways, uh, come crumbling down um but, yes. but i mean definitely got, got your point there but you know t t talking about this the, the this video that you that you referred to about you know packing packing the money kyle you know it, it almost seemed you know uh, the word savage is coming to my mind in the way that Vasasa, um you know you know, bribed people and and paid for things in the in the in the ANC, and and what really stands out to me, Karen. After we, um, I ask Carl this question. I want to come to you about former President Jacob Zuma, but but it it almost it almost feels like. Uh, you know what? What Adrian says. You know, you have to give a five thousand year and a and a bribe pack there, and but a big part of the scam, if you like, or, or the corruption, or the the, 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 mm. the modus operandi of of Bosasa, was that um, you the it, the ANC was heavily reliant on it. So that so 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 I mean I'm just looking now at the report from the from the uh, parts about the war room. So it was 2014. Mm. The ANC has its election. Jacob Zuma um, is is president, and and uh, literally the ANC was so. So what is a war room, Kyle? So the ANC uh, uh, you know has these these centers where they try to you know coordinate their election strategy right. from, and this yeah. is happening from inside the the devil's den if you like inside the Fasna's offices and someone yeah. like uh someone like um president Cyril Ramaphosa goes and visits this facility mm -hmm. but then doesn't ask any questions for me that's just completely and utterly shocking well well Quinita, I'll take it a step further and I'm going to you know just be very clear on this there's no realm of possibility that Cyril Ramaphosa did not know um, and, you know, as, as a senior ranking member of the ANC, he can he can say whatever he wants. Everyone in the party knew about Bosasa. Everyone knew about the Watsons. Everyone knew what how that what and how they operated. Um, it's it's there's just no there's no realm of possibility, whatever his protestations are, that he wasn't aware. Nonetheless, you know, um, you know, these war rooms were fascinating. They 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 put up these these video walls of these um, of of all the wards in the country during the national election. And I mean, if if anyone's ever been to the IEC's um, elections results center in Pretoria, um, it's much much the same as that. Except this one served a dual purpose. So they had Bosasa staff and ANC staff working together um, in in sort of like call centers, phoning around, coordinating things, you know, um, uh, making sure that uh, people were where they were supposed to be at the right time, that sort of thing. And then they had this massive video wall and a whole bunch of new computers that they had bought where ANC or Bosasa staff could sit and they could look at election results, they could look at where things were coming in. It was a very, very slick operation. You know, it, it it's very much like the IEC result center, just in miniature. And, and this is where it becomes very, very crucial. What Zondo found about Bosasa being reliant on the ANC staying in power for their business model to continue. We have to understand what their business model was. Bosasa did virtually no work outside of government tenders. This company was set up, designed, the things that they did, as Adrian alluded to earlier, where they, they did research and development on technology, it was all pointing towards, pushing towards getting more work from government. So it's very true what Zondo says, if they if the NC government did not stay in power or if their friends did not stay in power, that Bosasa would, you know, would fold. It would, it would eventually come to a grinding halt because these tenders, as we know, some of them run for five years, some of them run for a year, some for three years. And they bribed and made sure that these contracts were renewed. But when in 2017, 
there was going to be a changing of the guard. And no one knew what the new guard was going to look like. And that's when we really see this level of, you know, trying to keep the influence on Bosasa's side from Mr. Watson coming out. And that's when we really start to see how just, just, just how cunning this company really, really was. Hmm. And I mean, Karen, there, there, there was this part in the report where um, detailing, uh, you know, uh, the role of Numbula Mokunyani, the, uh, you know, she was uh, organizer in the ANC, she is um, uh, organizer in the ANC, an NEC member, and then obviously she was premier of Gauteng at, you know, during this time. But but for me, what really stood out, Karen, is, is the fact that when all of this evidence by Agriti and others came to the commission and she was called to come and give evidence, she lied. And that's, and, and, and uh, the uh, acting chief justice, Raymond Zonda said, you know, pointed to that that she she lied when she when she testified about her birthday party that Bosasa paid for saying there was no birthday party and then saying that you know um Agriti would have not been been uh you know at that at that party um and it just for me is so fascinating how um how long they kept the duplicity alive well, I think they need to. I think there's a necessity for denial in the ANC about the fact that they have essentially, as I said before, become a criminal enterprise. But, um, you know, what, what's so disturbing for me and what what is one of the most damning findings that's made um, in this report is, is this um, very, very strong evidence that the former president, Jacob Zuma, who we know routinely claims to have been a victim of prosecutorial misconduct, of politically tainted prosecution, um, he and his cohort, including uh, Dudu Mieni as well, um, appear to have been instrumental in blocking the prosecution of Bosasa for clear evidence of corruption, which is exactly what Karam was referring to previously. Um, we know that these Adrian's reporting was pivotal in this, but there were investigations that began in 2007. And then we see in 2009, the first meeting between Watson and Zuma, of course, has his own legal problems, but thanks to, uh, you know, the spy tapes is, is able to avoid prosecution for corruption. And then, according to the evidence led at the inquiry, and, and we know that there is strong evidence that a number of confidential pieces of information from the NPA made their way into the hands of the Basasa um, executive, including Watson. There's apparently this instrumental figure in preventing uh, this company from ever being held to account. And I think that, you know, we there was always this, this awareness of law enforce, enforcement having been captured. And we saw that in the way in which, for instance, Zuma's nemesis, finance minister, as he then was, uh, Pravin Gordon, was pursued on a baseless case involving SARS, another uh, captured entity at the time, um, you know, Anwar Dramat, Robert McBride, Glynis Breitenbach, all of those cases spectacularly uh, collapsing, um, some of them, you know, in Glynis's case, Breitenbach's case, um, getting acquitted. But Zuma now is alleged in, in these recordings, which are referred to in, in the Zondo inquiry, to have basically been on call um, from Watson about the potential of, of facing charges, about the potential of being investigated for this massive kind of corruption. Um, and as a result of phone calls that he is alleged to have made, uh, you know, Hawks officials hand over confidential minutes um, identifying, you know, who like who is likely to be charged. Um, and, you know, that is a staggering, staggering piece of evidence that the, the inquiry has accepted because it essentially says that not only did this, this organization capture an entire political party, the ruling party of this country, with everything from 50,000 rand um, cash payments to bribe packs, to birthday parties, to cakes, whatever it was, but they also, through that, managed to crush and, and break the spine of the justice system, where manifest corruption wasn't prosecuted for the entire nine years that Jacob Zuma was in office. And I think that the, the aftermath of that, that illustration, which we know recurred in all kinds of other aspects, is something that we are still living with today. Absolutely. And I mean, just to refer to the report, it says that there were reasonable grounds to suspect that the former president, Jacob Zuma, was in breach of his obligation as president under the Constitution, under the Executive Ethics Code, and that he broke the law. Um, 
you know, he, he, uh, you know, the report goes on to say that Busasa and its leadership provided bribes to Zuma. We know what, what, you know, was was paid to the Jacob Zuma Foundation. Busasa and its leadership clearly provided inducements and gain to Mr. Zuma, aim, aimed at gaining influence uh, over him. The report stated. So, so I mean, the, it couldn't, it, 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 it can't get worse than that. And and yet, yes. the Jacob Zuma Foundation comes out and says. The Zondo findings are not even worth the paper it's written on. Karam, it's, it's, it's a dance that we see, right? That every time there's more evidence, um, uh, you know, uh, shockingly more than the last time against former President Jacob Zuma, um, uh, you know, they, they, there's this sort of uh, nonchalant denial that, that, that persists. And it's, it, I mean, what more can we hear about the former president? I mean, the, the only thing that's left now is for us to see a picture of him physically, you know, accepting a bribe with his two bare hands. <laughs> you know, the, the, the evidence is, is absolute, that, um, you know, in all three parts of this report. And yet still, he can, he can dismiss this commission like he has been from the uh, uh, onset. Look, we, we know what Jacob Zuma's strategy has been all these years. It's been a Stalingrad strategy. He's never been interested in his day in court. He had an absolutely golden opportunity in front of the Zondo Commission to, to give his side of the story. And as he's gone after Billy Downer, uh, he, he went after Judge Zondo and on that basis said that, uh, you know, that, that there was a compromised commission because of this personal relationship. So it's 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 very unfortunate. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that nobody in the ANC, let alone President Zuma, has been willing to come forward and say, we, we acknowledge this. You know, I mean, even President Ramaphosa's statements around the a certain degree of acknowledgement was, was, were very, very, very weak statements. So um, there's so much frustration, I think, about the arms deal prosecution and the way that it's dragged on that I, I think we're almost at a moment now where one would like to see these new charges raised against Zuma. Uh, obviously, the arms deal prosecutions must continue. But I think, you know, in that thirst for, for prosecutions, for accountability, has to sit squarely uh, at former President Zuma's door. And one would expect to see a, a comprehensive set of charges laid against him related to these Bosasa findings. And you know some of the other findings, particularly the Transnet and SARS findings. Yeah, and I mean, you you speak about uh, you know President Sol Ramaphosa. Kyle, I'm going to bring you in here. There was a part of the report, and and, and a lot of focus was was placed on that. You wrote a lot about it. Um, the the this donation made by Bosasa to the CR17 campaign, and then the proximity of President Sol Ramaphosa's son Andile Ramaphosa to Bosasa, but. The report doesn't go in any detail. It basically says, well, the public protector investigated this, and so we didn't really touch it. Caused a lot of um, eyebrows to be raised. What did you make of it? Well, I, th I think my eyebrows were raised the furthest um, because, you know, this is something that is that I've, I've been closely following from, from the very beginning because what the Zondo Commission has found about how Bosasa operated, this corrupt modus operandi, Right. It, it has it has over 17 years secured the influence and and uh, and and favor of high ranking officials within the ANC, including the president at the time. And they did this through money, gratifications and bribes. So then you take a look at this donation that Gavin Watson made uh, to 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 the CR17 campaign, and he went through quite a a process to try and obscure the identity and, and, and movement of this money to CR17. And I, I you know, from the very beginning, I, I felt that something was off about this. And with respect to the public protector, you know, Advocate Busisiwe Mkwebane completely, completely messed up that investigation. She, she inserted words into the executive ethics code, which weren't there. And she was roundly criticized by the court for her, for, for her actions. There was a real opportunity for, for Judge Zondo and the commission here to either fully investigate the matter and reach a conclusion, which would have either been to absolve President Ramaphosa of wrongdoing or to place further questions or, you know, the onus on the president to explain this. Because what the report actually says, it does not say that this donation does not fall within our terms of reference. It says that we didn't investigate it, and I quote, in any serious way 
because the public protector had already investigated it. I think that's a bit of a cop-out. And I think what should have happened here is that Ramaphosa should have been brought to answer on this donation and really be drilled on the fact that, you know, um, there's reporting done by News24 especially that shows that you were consulted, uh, you know, on one or two occasions about who was donating to, ca to your campaign. And then we, we, in the back of your mind, you have the fact that, you know, the, this company buys influence through paying bribes, right? And then you get to learn of the fact that the president's son, Andile, was paid more than 3 million rand by this company in monthly retainer fees for a list of projects that nobody involved wants to disclose for commercial reasons. Um, and this, the payment of these money started in November 2017, just two months before his father would become president. Mm -hmm. And once you start asking these questions and saying to yourself, but this is a company that based its entire existence on doing work with government and having high ranking politicians, including the secretary general of the ANC, the water affairs minister, the former president in their pocket. Was this not an opportunity that they saw to have the Ramaphosa's on their side as well? And I think the commission should have investigated it. It should have brought Mr. Ramaphosa to answer these questions because the allegations were before them. They could have called for the allegations to be made properly before the commission. So I think it's something that is going to be a genuine point of criticism on the commission. And of course, it doesn't detract away from the findings that they've made on other people. Um, you know, because in terms of the Prevention of, of Corrupt Pr Practices Act, the, this this is very simple. These are very simple cases to prove. Guerre Montache can take the report on review every day of, of the following week. But yeah. the Hawks officials were at his house. They saw, as did we as the media, the cameras and everything still up on the side of his properties. The, he has to give an explanation for that. Yeah. He never I mean, attempted to pay for it. You know, it's 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 a simple case. Yeah. K Karen, let's let's bring you in here because Gwede Mantashi said this week that he's going to take uh, this report on judicial review. He says that uh, he disagrees with the assumptions made um, by the by, by the commission, saying that the, the commission sort of opted not to regard his evidence, um, and 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 also you know t taking it a step further, saying the commission should not get involved in ANC factions. Do you think that there's any, uh, you know, what what would come out of of Gwede Mantashi taking this report on review, if anything? Well, I think it's going to prove to be massively embarrassing to the ANC because essentially what the review will require court of law to ventilate is the very fact of, of what Zondor got to the heart of. It's essentially that you would, if you were able to, you know, quote unquote, by the favor of particular ANC officials, you would be assured of business within government. And that was the case. Not only that, you would be protected from investigation and you would certainly not face the full wrath of a parliamentary oversight body that's meant to hold you to account. So there's clear evidence of this all along the way. Greta Mantash, as many of, uh, you know, many people in, in his situation have done, is, is arguably making a very legal technical point. Oh, well, you know, I had no power. There were bid adjudication committees you know, this is not something that I was involved in. But the ANC's, you know, the people on bid adjudications were put there by ANC cater deployment committees. They were put there to do the ANC's bidding. You are acting like we haven't read part one, two, and, you know, the ones that will follow of the Zonda report, where it's made evidently clear that SOEs, you know, corrupt contracts were granted precisely because the ANC deployment committee put people in place who would be more than willing to go along with the we, with the corrupt wishes of people within and high levels of those parties and um you know in, who wanted the the guptas and various other people to to be fake so you know that you know I, I would welcome the review because i think you know if it gets um bashed out in in within the frameworks of the court i think some very very interesting arguments are going to be made but in any event what is the point you can't stop the NPA and law enforcement from investigating you through a review process. That's not going to happen. The evidence is there. It's on the table. It can be taken. It can be prosecuted. We know law enforcement is in a difficult position, whether that happens or not. But the effect, you know, of a challenge is is, is not really here nor there. I mean, you, you can't stop yourself from being investigated. So I think that, yeah. you know, it's more of a political statement. It's more, I think, an attempt to avoid 
the um, consequences of, of the step aside rule, even though he hasn't been charged, the, uh, these are fairly, fairly serious um, findings that have been made against him. But ultimately, you know, if, the, if that litigation persists, it's only going to further embarrass the ANC. And it's going to raise serious questions about whether or not this party is genuinely serious about dealing within the rot, about the, the rot within its ranks, or it's just simply an excuse to to try and convince the, the public that they are actually doing something when they are not planning to do anything at all. On Carl's point, one of the problems that I, and I, I completely agree with him on the Andile Ramaphosa issue, Andile Ramaphosa's payments um, from, from Bosasa were not the subject of a public protect investigation. She investigated yeah. CR17. His point about trying to curry favor with family members, as was evident with Makanyane's daughter, etc., was a pathology of Bosasa. What I find surprising is with the wide-ranging powers that they had, why did they not subpoena the work that Andile did for Bosasa? It would have been perfectly within their rights to establish what had happened. Because if we'd found, for instance, that, that work hadn't been legitimate, that this was simply an excuse in, in many respects to persist with this kind of glorified and elaborate process of, of money laundering and corruption, I think we would have had some certainty as to what had happened and whether he had done work for them or not. So it is a problem, and I think that it will feed into, you know, those kind of assertions that Gwede Mantash has made around factional politics. But ultimately, you know, his accusations don't legitimize this, delegitimize this report. And I think this litigation is going to backfire, and it's going to backfire horribly. I mean, Adrian, the, the uh, ANC, uh, you know, said that they, they kind of, you know, observed the report and there's this task team that has been uh, set up. The president says he's going to respond with action uh, come the end of June, beginning of July, and he'll report to parliament then. But I mean, this report really puts him, uh, 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 you know, very close to, to the... Or, you know, very close to the center of 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 the nefarious activities of state capture, more than more than you know other manifestations with the Guptas, etc. So he's in a Kunita, while listen, Kunita, absolutely. And while listening to Carl, it struck me now that there's something we have to talk about in this country, and that is the normalization of corruption, specifically mm. in the echelons of the ANC, not only of ANC leaders, but the ANC voters and the ANC. A, a community and South Africa as large. If you if you think about it, Bosasa was in the news for at least ten to twelve years before Gavin Watson was invited to attend Cyril Ramaphosa's son's wedding in Uganda. Now just think about that for a moment. It is your son's wedding. You are intimately involved as the father of the groom in the guest list. You know who's there. There's no way that Cyril Ramaphosa can say I didn't know that Gavin Watson. Uh, was corrupt or, 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 or controversial. Um, the Busasa case illustrates just how uh, insidious corruption has become mm -hmm. in the entire ANC system. Now, I'm not one of those people, and, and I mean, I, I try really hard. I really try hard to argue that there's still a good part of the ANC and that there's still good people in the ANC who don't believe in corruption. And I know some of those people, but it makes it very hard when you have three consecutive presidents, first Thabo Mbeki, who did nothing about the complaints about Bosasa, who in fact moved Vernie Peterson, a good, honest guy who was head of correctional services as DG tried to clean up that department, who moved him out of that department when he got too warm, when he was getting too close to Bosasa. Tabo Mbeki and Frank Chikane, who must come and account for this still, who moved Vernie Peterson to the sports department. Vernie Peterson died of a broken heart because he tried to tackle corruption in, in, in the Department of Correctional Services. Tabo Mbeki was close to the Watsons. He knew exactly who they were and what they were doing. Jacob Zuma, Karen has spoken about. He is going to face corruption trials for this. And then Soro Mapos are coming to try and explain that he didn't know. He didn't know who Watson was. He didn't know his son was in business. And by the way, his son signed a piece of paper that said, we won't be corrupt. Well, that is utter nonsense. You cannot be so naive. You cannot be so naive to believe that there's any world in which you can do business with Gavin Watson or Papa Le Shabani or Angela Agritsi, who was part of Osasa, when you have been seeing these articles, when we as journalists put our lives on the line, put our safety on the line for almost two decades to tell these stories. 
and you come there and you try and convince the country that this was just some innocent business deal. It's nonsense. And this worries me, Quinita, because it says mm. to me that corruption is no longer a shame, that in the ANC there's no longer a shame to associate with corrupt business people, that corrupt business people are no longer ashamed to flaunt their, flaunt their corrupt deeds, their corrupt cars, their houses that they bought with corruption. And I think, you know, we're going to have to see prosecutions. It can't be solved by one person. It can't be Andrea Johnson alone as the new head of the ID. But surely the NPA must not come, come to the party. Surely the media, we in the media and other publications must continue to publish these stories and tell these stories to make sure that we can never say we didn't know. Adrian, uh, on this point, I, I would like to say on behalf of our colleagues and probably on behalf of many South Africans, thank you for the work that you have done for shining the light on this brazen corruption and criminality that unfolded for you know more than a decade and a half and it, you know as the report uh, rightly states it was not easy in the sense that you were intimidated at every at every corner um and that you know going up against um gavin watson and and Busasa was you know going up against uh, a, a very formidable uh, uh, organized crime syndicate um which had the protection of not one but you know three presidents and so this is something that we as a country need to hang our heads in shame that after all of this, after the, 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 the Busasa era, you know, you then had subsequent to that, the Guptas coming in and perfecting the system of, of ingratiating themselves in the ANC, pulling a president close to them, buying cover, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, looting and, and, and uh, plundering from the state. Karam, I want to I want to get you uh, in here to talk about now what? What is it? Do we do we wait until we see convictions uh, in relation to these Busasa cases? Um, people are, are generally fatigued, uh, you know, in the sense that how much more are we going to hear about uh, these accusations of corruption and state capture without there being uh consequential outcomes so so where to from now from here yeah absolutely no it's a it's it is a delicate moment you know and, and we're in civil society we're all often asked uh you know what should our position be towards the mpa and i think i think we've been really patient with the mpa and i think we um we encourage and support the mpa to be able to exercise their mandate but we have to recognize as karen and others have said you know that the criminal justice system was gutted during this period um, and that their capacity to run uh, complex uh, commercial uh, prosecutions of this nature, multiple ones at the same time, uh, has to be tested because we haven't seen that. We haven't seen uh, significant high profile prosecutions. I stand subject to correction since the era of, of Jackie Salebi. So, um, you know, it's good to see that there has been some budget allocation, additional budget allocation. Um, it's good to see that the SIU is doing their work in terms of the work of the special tribunal uh, uh, to, to recover stolen assets. But I mean, the idea that we could re uh, recover anything uh, uh, from the Bosasa era, I think is, is probably suspect given, given the kind of money laundering that's taken place. But I think all we can do is to continue to advocate for the continued reform and capacity of the criminal justice system. But we absolutely need to start seeing cases enrolled uh, corruption cases enrolled in the system. We need to see dedicated court roles for corruption cases, and we need to see the um, you know the, this allocation of resources uh, yeah. appropriately utilized to to prioritize these cases. Karen, I mean, can you sort of give us an indication of where things stand in the criminal justice system? I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot, but but uh, uh, you know where things are in in relation to 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 the NPA's prosecutions so far. Well, we do have two Basasa-related um, prosecutions, and we know, of course, Angelo Agritzi is 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 now bringing an application to try and have um, you know his cases withdrawn on the basis of um, ill health, um, saying that he you know the the NPA doctors need to examine him. Um, but you know, in, in relation to Basasa, the truly heinous um, you know activities that have occurred, um, you know. Didi Mieni, for example, a pivotal figure in both this and SAA. Um, those cases, are, as far as I know, 
you know, SAA is sitting with with the the DPP in Joburg, and uh, for Sasa, there's simply at this stage nothing against her. Um, I did speak to Andrea Johnson earlier this week, and that that will be in News 24 tomorrow. But she was just saying, look, the fact of the matter is that we're looking at thousands and thousands of cases, and we're going to have to make some very like specific selections about what we can pursue and when we can pursue them. But I think that there is, it's becoming increasingly apparent not only that the NPA needs to, de to, to develop very firm and substantive policy around hybrid prosecutions where private counsel are bring, brought in to, to prosecute complex commercial and um, corruption crime, but also that the NPA may very well have to consider uh, issuing nolly prosecuri um, certificates in certain cases where they are not going to be able to, to prosecute. And, you know, those kind of high level SOAE um, complex racketeering um, commercial crime, you know, intricate matters like dealing with Transnet, ESCOM, etc. We know the SIU is pursuing the Guptas and others for, for what happened at ESCOM in terms of that 3.8 um, billion rand with Optimum. But I think the public just feels understandably yeah. so this, this is not enough and there needs to be more. And I would really urge the NPA instead of I'm always fixating on very complex racketeering matters that will take five, six years to finalize, to really start taking cases to court where they can score, like what we would say, um, you know, easy wins. Uh, because right now, until someone sure. starts, we start seeing convictions, I think the South African public would be right, like Adrian to feel very, very angry, very frustrated. And like people have decimated the country and have gotten away with it. Kyle, very quickly, uh, what more can we expect from the next sort of two pa parts of the Zonda Commission that's still uh, uh, yet uh, to be made public or, or, or to be submitted to the president? What, what's next now for, uh, that we can expect from the Zonda Commission? I'm, I'm sure everyone else in the country, similar to me, are, are quite uh, fatigued by Mr. Zonda now. But uh, ESCOM, still to come. State Security Agency, still to come. Uh, both of those extremely big topics and I understand that there's a, a part about the free state uh, asbestos uh, scandal that's also yet to come so uh, hopefully we'll have those by the end of this month and uh, yeah the SSA ESCOM those are those are two big topics that I think are going to further shake the core of the ANC and Adrian you know we'll leave the last word to you considering <laughs> how much Basasa has played a role in your life but I mean just to sum it up um, you know, to our, our viewers watching today, uh, what what can they take from all of this? And, and yeah. should there be, is there any silver lining uh, yeah. that, that the country can reflect on? Look, I think I got to get carried away at your last question, uh, Kunita, but um, I, I do really get upset um, when I think back to people like Vernie Peterson, you know, who really tried to fight corruption. There are many Vernie Petersons still in our country. There are lots of good people in our government departments, in private companies, in the law enforcement agencies, and definitely in the media, many of them on this call, who want to fight corruption and who want to see justice being done and who want to see our government using its um, increasingly... Uh, a shrinking budget and money that we don't have to borrow abroad to actually provide real services to the people of this country and specifically the poor. So I think we need to keep doing what we do best, which is tell the stories. Um, and I specifically want to thank the whistleblowers again. You know, if it's not for whistleblowers, yes, we do put our names out there and we sometimes get threats and it's not nice. But at least we have uh, protection from our organizations that we work for and from our colleagues. The whistleblowers take a much bigger chance when they call us at late at night, when they drop documents, you know, when they help us to understand and unpack these stories. There were plenty of them um, over the years that helped me to expose Bosasa. And if it wasn't for them, and, and many of them uh, lost their jobs, lost, lost their livelihoods, um, and in the case of Vernie, lost his life during this period. If it wasn't for them, we won't be able to do this job. So please support the whistleblowers. Um, all of us, um, journalists, readers, viewers, you can support them in any kind of way. Support them financially. There's new um, bodies being set up to support them um, or just um, in any way possible. You know, make it possible for people to blow the whistle in a safe way that doesn't threaten their lives and livelihoods. Um, I think that's a that's a lesson I take from this um, and just to continue to talk about it and, and do what is right. Thank you very much. Adrian Besson is the Editor-in-Chief of News24, Carl Cohen. Thank you, Karen Morn and Karen Singh. Thank you to the viewers for joining us today. 
um, and uh, th you can read more on our coverage uh, uh, on Busasa and other state capture related stories on news24.com. Thank you again.